Hi everyone and welcome to Chapter 3 of the Verge Textbook. Chapter 3 is where most students really hit the first really hard stuff of chemistry. This is stoichiometry. This is when we really start hitting the math problems and these big word problems. So I'm, there's a lot of problems in this chapter. I'm going to just hit the ones that are harder as far as more students struggle with them and skip over the easier stuff. So stuff that I've already skipped over at this point in the chapter is how to calculate the total mass of the molecular formula, how to find percent composition. Those are usually easier problems that students are able to figure out on their own. So I'm going to skip right ahead to try and keep this lecture under an hour. And if you have trouble with any of that early material, please just let me know. All right, so first question I'm going to do is a balancing equation problem. So I'm going to be balancing an equation. So from this problem, it says assume that the only products are carbon dioxide and water. Write and balance the equation for the metabolism of butyric acid, and they've given us the formula for butyric acid. Now metabolism, that's what our bodies do. We take in some sort of fuel source, in this case it's going to be butyric acid. We consume oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide and water vapor. So what we're going to be doing here is showing out the entire balanced out equation for it. So first of all, we start with butyric acid, so our C4, H8, O2. And I'm going to react it with the oxygen that's consumed. And the only products we're told of are carbon dioxide and water. Now, I haven't included states of matter just because the question did not specifically ask me to include states of matter. And I'm just trying to balance this here. So, back in Chapter 2, Dalton's Law of Atomic Theory told us that in a chemical reaction, these atoms can't be created or destroyed and, or changed from one kind to another. They can only be rearranged, which means all the carbon atoms I started with, I need to end up with that many carbon atoms. All the hydrogen atoms, all the oxygen atoms, etc. So, the way that I like to set these up is I write down each element or polyatomic ion down the middle here, right the arrow where we switch from reactants to products. So in this reaction I have three elements. I have carbon, I have hydrogen, I have oxygen. Now if you had a polyatomic ion that occurred on both sides, you could treat it as a unit here also. And I'm going to write up to the side here how many carbons I started with. I started with four. And I ended with one. How many hydrogens I started with? I started with eight. And I ended with two. How many oxygens I started with? I have two here and two here for a total of four. And I ended with two here, one there, or three. So the easiest thing is to start at the balancing the most complicated molecules and work your way down to the simplest elements balancing them last. That's because my change prefix in front of one of the bigger molecules is going to affect several elements, whereas if I change the prefix just in front of this oxygen, it would only affect one element. So I'm going to start with this first compound here. And I've got four carbons on this side and one carbon on this side. So to balance the carbons, I would need to put a four in front of my carbon dioxide. I cannot change these subscripts. These subscripts are set. That's another part of Dalton's atomic theory, is that those ratios cannot be changed. But what I can change is the numbers written out in front, the quantities, how many carbon dioxide molecules I have. That's called a stoichiometric coefficient. I can change that. So if I change that to four here, now I have four carbons. But wait a minute, I also changed my number of oxygens here. Now I have four times two, or eight, plus I've still got one there. So I'm now up to nine oxygens on my product side. Let's worry about that later. Moving on down the line, next thing to worry about is hydrogen. I'm starting with eight. I'm ending with two. So how can I get up to eight on this side? And I can multiply the water molecule by four. So if I multiply my water molecule by four, now I'm up to eight hydrogens. But what else did that change? Oxygen again. So remember, I've got four times two, eight oxygens on the this side, and I've got four times one, four there, so I'm up to 
12 oxygens here. So oxygen I saved for last. I've got 12 on the product side. I need a 12 on my reactive side. I've got four so far. Two right there and two right there. Well, if I changed the prefix here, that would make a big mess because I would also be changing my numbers of carbons and hydrogens and resetting these numbers here. But these numbers are already happy. They're the same on both sides. I don't want to do that. So I'm only going to change this one. So I've got 12 that I need. There's two already taken care of, so I need 10 more. So I'm going to multiply this by 5. So plus 5 oxygen molecules. And that will bring me up to 12. 12 oxygen atoms. So make sure when you're done, count up your total number of each atom, of each type on each side, and make sure they add it up to the same on both sides. And you balance your chemical equation. Now remember these numbers in front, if there is no number, it's understood to be 1. It's an understood 1 in front of the butyric acid here. And these numbers, you'll hear me refer to for the rest of the chapter here, as stoichiometric coefficients. So now that we have our balanced equation, now these are can be considered molecules of butyric acid or they can be considered moles of butyric acid. But they are, can never be considered grams of something. So in, when we're starting to balance out stoichiometric problems, make sure it's certain you're either in molecules or moles before you start moving around these. So let's talk, see about what I mean by moles on the next slide. Alright, so once we have a balanced equation and we're going to need everything in moles, but if I go into my lab and I measure something, it's likely going to be in grams. I'm going to measure this in the balance, I'll get grams of the substance. So my first step is going to be able to converting grams to moles. So this is a lovely flow chart on page 92 of your textbook that I highly recommend going back to and looking at frequently as a reference. It shows us how to get from grams to moles and from moles to particles, whether those are atoms, molecules, or formula units, and back and forth. You can just stick from grams to moles, moles to particles, or all the way from grams to particles and back just by following the arrows. Now make sure when you're going between grams and moles, you follow the arrow that points towards moles, whereas if you're going between moles back to grams, follow that arrow. And just do what it does. One, it says molar mass, of course. That's going to be the mass of what you're looking at. So if you're looking at an atom of oxygen, the molar mass would be 16.00. And the units for, for molar mass, we're now using not and units, but grams per mole. So our units will cancel. If you're looking at a molecule of oxygen, Oxygen, of course, is one of those diatomics, so a molecule of oxygen, that's O2, so you'd be looking at 32 grams per mole. If I'm looking at a compound, say a molecule of water, adding up two hydrogens and one oxygen would give me the 18.02 grams per mole, the molar mass of water. So that's what it means by molar mass. Na here, that's Avogadro's number, or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that has units of particles per mole, where particles could be atoms, molecules, formula units, whatever you're looking at in the problem. All right, so let's go ahead and try out this. Determine A, the number of moles of carbon in 10 grams of naturally occurring carbon, and then we're going to go backwards. So I've got 10 grams of naturally occurring carbon. Now carbon does not exist as a diatomic. Naturally occurring it is just carbon, just one atom. So 10 grams of carbon. All right. Now it wants to know the number of moles. So if we look back at our flow chart, I'm starting at grams. I want to get to moles. The flow chart says divide by molar mass. So I'm going to divide this by molar mass, molar mass of the carbon. I've only got one atom, and carbon has a molar mass of 12.01 grams per mole. Make sure you're using the units at every step. This 
if I'd actually multiplied rather than dividing here, my units wouldn't have canceled. So this is your check to make sure you're doing it right, is to have to make sure your units cancel. And grams divided by grams cancel out grams. One over, one over moles brings moles back to the top. All right, so 10 divided by 12.01 moles. And it's 0.8326. Moles. So I have my moles of carbon here. Now this part B wants to know the mass of 0 0.905 moles of sodium chloride. Okay. Part B. So I have 0 0.905 moles of sodium chloride, or NaCl. And I want to get to the mass, or get to grams. So if I go back to my flowchart, now I have moles. I'm going back to grams, it says to multiply by the molar mass. So I need to multiply this by the molar mass of what? Sodium chloride. So I'm going to go to my periodic table, I'm going to add the molar mass of sodium and chlorine. And when I do that, I get 58.44. This is the molar mass, so it's in grams per mole. So when I multiply moles, and divided by moles, moles will cancel, and I'll be left with grams. 0.905 times the molar mass should give me 52.89 grams of sodium chloride. So this is going from moles to grams, grams to moles. Let's try taking it one step further. Determine the number of water molecules and the number of hydrogen and oxygen atoms in 3.26 grams of water. So I've got 3.26 grams of water, H2O, and it wants me to get first to the number of water molecules. So looking at my flowchart, starting at grams, I want to get to here, number of molecules. So the steps say to first divide by molar mass, that'll give me to moles. And then, come down here, multiply by Avogadro's number, and that will get me to my molecules. So let's try that out. So first, I'm going to divide by the molar mass. Molar mass of two hydrogens and one oxygen is 18.02 grams per mole. So that will get rid of grams and leave me with moles. And I plug that into my calculator, and I get 0. 1809 or 18. Let's see this, 09. I have a few extra figures in it. For now, we're on the very end, and now I'm in moles of water. Make sure you include the entire unit. Don't just say moles, because saying moles is like saying dozen. Say I've got five dozen, doesn't make sense. Five dozen what? So say but moles of water, because in a minute we're going to get to dealing with individual atoms, so you have to specify whether I'm looking at the atom yet or I'm still looking at the full molecule. I'm still looking at the full molecule. Alright, so I'm halfway there. I've converted to moles. Now I need the final part, which is now to multiply by Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And the units in Avogadro's number are particles, whichever particle you're dealing with. Here we're dealing with molecule. So I'm going to say molecules per mole. So moles will cancel and I'll be left with molecules of water. One point not that one. the reason of figure, so one point zero nine times ten to the twenty third molecules of H two O. Alright, so I've done the first part, I found the number of water molecules. Now I need to know the number of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So that's a simple ratio. Let's start with how many molecules I have right down here. 1.09 times 10 to the 23rd water molecules. Now, I'm going to multiply my ratio. Let's look at hydrogen first. So how many hydrogen atoms in every oxygen, or every hydrogen atom for every water molecule? This ratio is the same as any ratio we have dealt with in any sort of unit conversions all the way back to chapter one. I'm going to take the unit I currently have 
put it down on the bottom so it cancel out. In the top, I'll put whatever I want. I want to know about hydrogen atoms. So hydrogen atoms. Now, as for the numbers in front, well, we know the ratio. There's two hydrogen atoms in every one water molecule. We already knew that. So there's nothing, there's, there's nothing crazy going on here. It's everything you actually already know. So I'm just going to multiply this number by 2, and that gives me 2.18. Times 10 to the 23rd. And now I'm in hydrogen atoms. I could do the same thing for oxygen atoms. Now, oxygen atoms ratio would be 1 to 1, so I would get the same number here for the oxygen atoms. And then part B wants you to work backwards. And the full solution for this is the same problem with 3.7, so you can look up the full solution for that. But we're going to keep on moving forward and try and keep the time down on this video. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about is empirical formulas from percent composition. So we touched on empirical formulas last chapter. It's the lowest whole number ratio. And we touched on percent composition. Percent composition is the percentage of a whole in the beginning of this chapter. Now I'm looking to, given the percent composition, work backwards to the empirical formula. So this, this is a whole lot less tricky than it sounds like. I've got these percentages of two things, and I want to know what the lowest whole number ratio is by working backwards. First step on any of these problems is to choose a sample size. So step one, pick a sample size, and you're going to pick one that's going to make your math easy. And I don't know about you, but I'm talking about percentages. My easiest number is 100. So I'm going to pick a sample. In this case, I'm going to pick 100 grams. It doesn't matter what sample size that we picked, the percentage is going to be the same. Chapter 2 and the Law of Definite Proportions tells us that. It doesn't matter what size our sample is. It's not going to change what our formula is. So we can pick whatever sample size makes our math the easiest. So if I pick 100 grams, let's look at that. 100 gram sample. Of that 100 gram sample, 30.45% of it is nitrogen. So how many grams of nitrogen do I have? 100 grams, 30.45% of it is nitrogen. So I have 30.45 grams of nitrogen. Not so bad. And likewise, oxygen. 69.55% of 100 grams is 69.55 grams oxygen. See why I picked a 100 gram sample? Makes my mouth a lot easier, a lot prettier. So now I want to know the empirical form of the whole number ratio. But it's a molar ratio here, not a gram ratio. It's a molar ratio, empirical formula. So I need to take these numbers. In order to get a molar ratio, I must first convert to moles. Convert to moles. Ta-da, we already know how to do that. We just did it. So to convert by to moles, way back to our slide earlier, to go from grams to moles, it says divide by molar mass. We can do that. That's easy. So our 30.45 grams of nitrogen, just divide that by the molar mass of nitrogen, which is 14.01 grams per mole. And do the same thing for your oxygen. Molar mass of oxygen is 16. Grams and grams cancel. Here I'm left with moles of nitrogen. And here I'm left with moles of oxygen. And that will give me 2.17, 3 moles of nitrogen, and 4.347 moles of oxygen. Oh, wait, you just said I needed a whole number ratio. These aren't whole numbers. Well, I'll show you a little trick for getting them to be whole numbers. Take whichever, and you can have more than just two elements here. Here, I've only got two. Take whichever one you have the fewest number of moles. In this case, the nitrogen is the smallest number. So pick your smallest number and divide everything by that smallest number. So if I divide this by itself, that's, of course, going to give me one, right? So that will give me one nitrogen. Take this number, divide by it, 
I thought of 2.173. And that gives me approximately 2 oxygen. Hey, look, now I'm in a whole number ratio. So that tells me the empirical formula is NO2. I've got one nitrogen and two oxygens. So dividing by the smallest number, I'm going to write that up here. Divide by smallest number to get whole numbers. Divide by smallest number to get whole numbers. That trick we'll see again when we do combustion analysis. Now, say I did not get whole numbers here. Say, for just you know, argument's sake, say instead I got, say, one nitrogen and, say, 0.667, something that's clearly not going to round to a whole number. Then you're going to round to the nearest fraction. Well, 0.667. Seven. Well, that's the nearest fraction, but that's two-thirds. Round to the nearest fraction. So I have N, O, two-thirds. But wait, an empirical formula has to be whole numbers. So I'm going to multiply through to get a whole number. What can I multiply? The smallest number I can multiply, two-thirds by to get a whole number. I can multiply through by three. Three. So basically, it's whatever your denominator is, what you're going to multiply everything through by. So if I multiply through by 3 here, that would give me N3 O2 as my ratio. So this is what to do when your uh, number here is actually a fraction instead of a whole number here. So because obviously not every empirical formula is going to have only one of them. So this is how we get those that do not have exactly one of them. So the next thing we're going to talk about is combustion analysis. Combustion analysis is taking it one step further and looking more at what we actually would have as far as analyzing an unknown compound and trying to determine what the identity of that compound is. So combustion analysis. Combustion means burning it. Okay, we burn it. So now combustion analysis basically means I have some compound. I don't know what it is. I'm going to burn it and measure everything that's left over after I burn it. So things that we can combust. Hydrocarbons, meaning carbon, hydrogen, sometimes there's oxygen. Of some ratios, X, Y, Z, there doesn't have to be oxygen. So C might be zero. So some hydrocarbons with some ratio, so whether this is ethanol or methane or propane, we burn our, in our uh, uh, Labor Day cookouts this weekend. We're going to react this, and now combustion. What do fires consume in addition to fuel? Oxygen. Okay, so fires consume fuel and oxygen. What are the products? Well, carbon dioxide is one product. The other product is H2O, water vapor, comes off. So here's our general reaction. Now, of course, it's not balanced, but we're not really being worried about balanced. So the idea behind combustion analysis is I can measure how much carbon dioxide comes off. I can measure how much water comes off. I can measure how much fuel I put in. I cannot measure how much oxygen was consumed because that's just oxygen being pulled out of the air. But if I look at these numbers, every gram of carbon that was in my original sample ended up where? In my carbon dioxide. So if I have grams of carbon dioxide and I get that down to just grams of carbon, how do I get that down to grams of just the carbon. Well, I take my grams of carbon dioxide and I multiply it by my percent composition carbon in carbon dioxide. Now, the comp percent composition of an element in a compound, we did that read back in the beginning of this chapter. So if I multiply my grams of total carbon by the percent of that that should be just carbon, multiply my grams of carbon dioxide by the percent that should just be carbon, that will give me grams of just carbon. Well, if that's grams of carbon that was produced, that will be equal to how many grams of carbon I started with. So that will give me 
grounds carbon here. All right, let's do the same thing with the hydrogen. So hydrogen, all of those grams of hydrogen end up in our water. So to get grams of H2O down to just grams of water, or just grams of hydrogen, I'm going to multiply by the percent composition of hydrogen in H2O. All right, and then I get those grams, and that gives me the grams of hydrogen there. Now, if I have any grams of oxygen, I can't figure that out here because some of it could have ended up in carbon dioxide, some of the oxygen, there may not even be any. So to get grams of oxygen, it's equal to your starting mass of your compound and then you're going to subtract off how many grams are carbon and subtract off how many grams of hydrogen and if you have any left over that will be grams of oxygen. If you have nothing left over that means that you're we were only burning a car hydrocarbon there was no oxygen in it. Alright, so I've got grams carbon, grams hydrogen, and grams oxygen. At this point in time, I am the same as the last problem. I'm the same as, back here, empirical formula. I've got grams of each. I want to know what that, what that empirical formula is. So I'm going to convert to moles and get the lowest whole number ratio. So it's the same problem except I've got a little bit of work in the front. So let's go ahead and look at that. Here's our combustion analysis problem, sample problem 3.9. Combustion of a 5.5 0 gram sample of benzene produces 18.59 grams of carbon dioxide and 3.81 grams of water. Determine the empirical formula and the molecular formula of benzene given that its molar mass is approximately 78 grams per mole. So determine the empirical formula just like we just went over and at the very end we can use this number to turn the empirical formula into the molecular formula. But first of all, normally in these problems you wouldn't be told the identity of the sample because it would be unknown. So instead of writing the formula for benzene, I'm just going to write that it's something containing carbon and hydrogen and possibly oxygen. And I'm going to react it with oxygen to perform carbon dioxide and water and I have 5.50 grams of it and I produce 18.59 grams of carbon dioxide and 3.81 grams of water. Alright, so first step, looking back at our plan of attack here. To get grams of just carbon, I'm going to take how many grams of carbon dioxide I have and I'm going to multiply that by the percentage of carbon and carbon dioxide. So my percent of carbon and carbon dioxide so is the molar mass of carbon, 12.01. I'm going to divide it by the molar mass of carbon dioxide. And the molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44.01 grams per mole, and I'm going to multiply by 100, and that will give me 27.29%. Alright, so I'm taking my mass of carbon dioxide by 18.59 grams, grams of carbon dioxide, and to make that just grams of carbon, I'm going to multiply by this percentage. Of course, I'm going to multiply in the decimal form. So I'm going to be multiplying by 0.2729, and that will give me just grams of carbon. And that gives me 5.07 grams of carbon. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the water molecule. So let's find the percentage of hydrogen in water. So molar mass of hydrogen is 1.2. 0.08. Now there's two hydrogens, so don't forget to multiply this by two. Over the molar mass of water, which is 18.01, which 
sorry, 0, 2 times 100. And that gives me 11.19%. So, on grams of hydrogen, I'm going to take that 3.81 grams of water. And I'm multiplying by my 11%, so times 0.1119. And that will give me 0.4265 grams of hydrogen. Now, see if I have any oxygen. I'm going to see if I have any mass left over. So I started with 5.50 grams of my sample. I'm going to subtract off the grams of carbon. And subtract off the grams of hydrogen. And this will give me approximately zero, which means that I, I had no oxygen, so it's just carbon and hydrogen. All right, so now I've got grams of each. At this point, I'm at the same step in the problem that I was with that empirical problem back, let's look here, here, determining the empirical form. I have grams of each. So the next step is to convert to moles and then divide by the smallest whole number. All right, so I need to convert these grams of carbon and grams of hydrogen to moles. So remember to go from grams to moles and divide by molar mass. So molar mass of carbon is 12.01 grams per mole. And grams of hydrogen per mole is 1.008. Plug those both in. And I get 0.422. Moles now, I mean moles of carbon and point for this, it's supposed to be four, this will come out at nine, sorry, that's four. Point four two three moles of hydrogen. So I don't even have to divide by the smallest number to see if these are pretty close to the same number. If I divide by this number, I'm going to get pretty close to one. So my empirical formula then would just be one to one or CH which is as far as the other problem went. My empirical formula, right there. Now to get to molecular formula, it gives us the molar mass. Well, why would it give us that? Well, my empirical formula, let's see what the empirical formula mass is. I've got one carbon, and I've got one hydrogen. So if I add up the mass of one carbon and one hydrogen, that means gives me an empirical formula mass of approximately 13, so 0 0.02, but approximately 13 grams per mole is my empirical formula mass. But I'm given in the data that its molar mass for the entire molecule is 78. How is that possible? Well, remember, empirical formula is your lowest whole number ratio. So this could be C2H2, C4H4, C3H3. It just simplifies down to 1 to 1. So now we're going backwards. Well, how do we find what ratio we're supposed to multiply through by? It's the ratio of the formulas. So the molecular mass over the empirical mass. So 78 divided by that 13 is going to give me approximately 6. So 6 is the ratio to multiply through by. So the molecular formula molecular formula would be C6 H6 not done so there's my empirical formula and my molecular formula and that's all there is to a combustion analysis problem of course if I had gotten some number here that would have been grams of oxygen so I would just have one more line here for grams of oxygen. All right, here we go, down to the meat of stoichiometry. This is the most common stoichiometry type problem you're going to see when you have something that goes, okay, that goes if I have some number, grams of something x, 
how many grams of Y is produced or needed. This is the general format of these questions. Yeah, I have some grams of some component X, how many grams of component Y are produced from needed, whether it's a product or a reactant. When these are both X and Y are in the same reaction, they could both be reactants, they could both be products, one could be a reactant, one could be a product. It doesn't matter. All that matters is I have some sort of balanced chemical reaction for them. Now, I like to simplify this down to something I call the three simple rules of stoichiometry. Three simple rules. Of stoichiometry. Number one, we know that before we can use a balance equation, as we saw earlier, what unit do we have to be in? Moles. It can't be in grams. So number one is to convert those grams of X to moles of X. Grams of X to moles of X. Well, how do I convert from grams to moles? Divide by molar mass. whatever x is. So at this point, now another thing to note about these three simple rules, whatever you end with at the end of one rule is exactly what you start with at the beginning of the next rule. So rule number two starts with moles of x. So I'm going to take those moles of x and multiply moles of x by my stoichiometric ratio, which means moles y over moles x. This is my stoichiometric ratio. So moles x will cancel and be left with moles y. Well, where does this ratio come from? It comes from my balanced equation. So if x was the first compound here and y was the water here, it would be 1x to 2y's. It's just the ratio from your balanced equation, these stoichiometric coefficients in front of your balanced equations. So at the end of this, moles of x will cancel and you'll be left with moles of y. So step three is to convert those moles of y back to grams. And how do I get from moles back to grams? You do that by multiplying by the molar mass. Now I'm in y, so I'm going to use y's molar mass. All right, so there's three simple steps. So let's apply these three simple steps to this problem and these two questions here. So I'm starting with my X is, in this case, it says, calculate the mass of ammonium nitrate. Don't be scared by these names. This is just from Chapter 2. Ammonium was NH4. Nitrate was NO3. These are polyatomic ions from page 62, your polyatomic ion table. So don't be scared by the big names. Calculate the mass of ammonium nitrate, so this thing, that must be heated in order to produce 10 grams of nitrous oxide. That's this thing. So 10 grams of nitrous oxide, that is what we are starting with. It is a product, but it is our starting amount. We're working backwards. We, we want to make 10 grams. How much of this did we have to heat is what it's asking. So this is our X right here, nitrous oxide, 10 grams of nitrous oxide. So I'm starting with step one, 10 grams of nitrous oxide, N2O. So my first step is to convert to moles by dividing by the molar mass of X. So two nitrogens and an oxygen total up to a mass of 44.02 grams per mole. So that works out to 0.227 moles of N2O. All right, so step one, done. 
Step two is to multiply moles of x by the ratio of moles y over moles x. All right, so I'm at my x is N2O. I want to know about ammonium nitrate, so that's my y. All right, so what's the ratio? Well, there's no numbers in front of them, so that's an understood one, an understood one. So my ratio is one to one, and so it'll cancel. And I'll just, my numbers can change, so I'm just multiply by one. So I'm left with 0.227 moles of NH4 and O3, my ammonium nitrate. All right, step, step two done. So step three is to convert moles of Y to grams of Y by multiplying by molar mass of Y. So it's molar mass of NH4 and O3. So let's add up the nitrogens, add two of them, four hydrogens, three oxygens. It should all add up to 80.052 grams per mole. So most by cross, mole cancel, and I'll be left with grams of NH4, 18.0 grams of NH4. And O3. Alright, so part A done. Part B says determine the corresponding mass of water produced in this reaction. So now instead of finding out ammonium nitrate, it wants us to find out how much water would also be produced if I produce this 10 grams of nitrous oxide. So it's still going to be these three steps here, but uh, we've already done the first step. We've already converted X to moles. So I'm going to be starting here. So I'm going to start, I already have my 0.227 moles of N2O. So now I'm looking at N2O and I want to look at water. Again, like I said, X and Y just have to be in the same equation. They don't have to be on opposite side of this arrow. It could be two products. As long as they're in the same equation, this equation's balanced, we can do this. All right, so to get to water, I'm going to put my current substance on the bottom and what I'm trying to get to on top, so I'm trying to get the water. Alright, now the ratio. Two goes with the water. One goes with the nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide will cancel and I'll be left with my 0.4 moles of water. Here now at moles of y. So my last step is to convert moles of y to grams of y by multiplied by the molar mass of y. That means I have moles of water, I want to get to grams of water, and multiply by the molar mass of water, which is 18.02 grams per mole. I'll cancel, and I'll be left with 8.18 grams of water produced. So these three steps can get you between anything in an equation. Grams of this to grams of that, grams of that to grams of that, grams of this to grams of that, doesn't matter. Anything inside this balance equation you can use these three simple rules for. Right. Next concept is limiting reactants. And take this one step further because in this problem I only had one reactant, so I can't have a limiting reactant. But Say I had another problem where I had more than one reactant and I had given amounts of both. Well, unless I really measure this perfectly, I'm going to run out of one sooner than the other. Let's try this concept of something a little bit less scary than a chemical reactant. Let's look at uh, baking a cake. So let's have it overly simplified the recipe for baking a cake. And I'm going to give the recipe if it takes two cups of sugar and four cups of flour and that will make one cake. Alright, so simplified, only got two ingredients. Two ingredient cake. Two cups of sugar and four cups of flour will make one cake. Alright, so say I look at my pantry and I want to make as many cakes as possible. And I look at my pantry and I say that I have six cups of sugar and I've got eight cups of flour. 
So I've got some questions here. Which one of these amounts is limiting how many cakes I can make? Whichever one limits it, that's my limiting reactant. How many cakes can I make from these two? Well, whichever one is my limiting reactant, that's going to determine the maximum number of cakes I can make. And my final question would be, well, whichever one is my excess, didn't get used all the way up, how much of that will I have left? Now, it might be easy for you to do in your head, but look, okay, it takes two cups of sugar and four cups of flour. Then six cups of sugar means I can make three cakes. Eight cups of flour means I can make two cakes, so I'm going to run out of flour first. So flour is my limiting reactant. Here's where a lot of students, especially once these cups of sugar, cups of flour gets replaced with chemical names, go wrong as they say, well, six is less than eight, so six is my limiting reactant. Uh, not always. In this case, actually, the eight was my limiting reactant. So I'm going to work out this problem. You know, I know you can do it in your head, but I'm going to work it out the same way I'm going to work it out for the next question, which is a chemical problem, and just show you it's just the same. I'm just going to replace these words, sugar and flour, with scary chemical names. I'm not going to hear. So, to find out how many cakes I could make from the six cups of sugar. You probably did in your head, but what you basically did was a stoichiometry problem. I multiplied, okay, for every cake, one cake, it takes two cups of sugar. That's, hey look, right there. Those are your stoichiometric coefficients. It takes two cups of sugar. So cross them out, and I have six times one divided by two, three cakes. Now you did that in your head, but that was basically what you were doing, a stoichiometry problem. All right. Now my eight cups of flour, same thing here, to make one cup of flour, or one cake rather, to make one cake, it took four cups of flour, right there. Again, those are just your stoichiometric coefficient there. Four cups of flour. All right, so flour crosses out, and I'm left with eight times one divided by four, two cakes. So I'm going to pick the one that made fewer cakes. That is my true value. Whichever one made less product, that is my true value. So this tells me that flour, therefore, was my limiting reactant. I'm just going to put LR. Limiting reactant. Sugar, therefore, must have been my excess reactant. And the actual amount of cakes that I made from my limiting reactant this is called my theoretical yield. Theoretically, if I were to use up all my flour, this is how many cakes I should go make. Doesn't always work out that way. I might have burned one. Theoretical yield. All right. So theoretically, if everything worked perfectly, I would get two cakes. So you do this your theoretical yield, your limiting reactant, and your excess reactant. So the last part of this question was, well, how much of my excess reactant would I have left? So that question then would go off, well, how many cups of sugar would I use up to make those two cakes? So I'm going to take those two cakes and figure out how much sugar was needed. So now I'm going to go backwards. So cake would go down to the bottom, and now sh cups of sugar would go on the top. And for one cake, it took two cups of sugar. So cake cancels and I'm left with four cups of sugar. So four cups of sugar were used. And how many did I start with? Six. So I started with six cups of sugar were given. I only used four of them, so subtract, and I have two cups left of sugar, specify two cups of what? Two cups of sugar left over. Uh, two cups of sugar left. So we've determined the limiting reactant. We've determined our theoretical yield, and we've determined how many cups of our excess we had left. So that wasn't so bad, was it? Let's 
change out flour, cake, and sugar with scary chemical names and see how much worse it gets. In this video, we'll be talking about how to do a limiting reactant problem. So a limiting reactant problem can be recognized by a stoichiometry problem where you're given amounts of two different reactants and asked for the amount of the product. So for example, an Alka-Seltzer tablet contains 1.7 grams of sodium bicarbonate, that's NaHCO3, sodium bicarbonate, and one gram of citric acid, or citric acid. Determine for a single tablet dissolved in water which ingredient is the limiting reactant, the limiting reactant being the ingredient that gets used up first, what mass of the excess reactant, meaning whatever one does not get used up first, is left over when the reaction is complete, and what mass of carbon dioxide forms, carbon dioxide being one of the products of this reaction. So an Alka-Seltzer tablet, we're familiar with it, used for heartburn or stomach upset, and when you drop it in a glass of water, you see it bubble as it dissolves. So the two primary ingredients are sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda, and citric acid, which is the acid found in uh, citrus such as lemons. When those two come together, this is a base and an acid, they react an acid-base reaction. Carbon dioxide bubbles are formed, that's when you see the bubbling, and the byproducts are water and sodium citrate. But we're only worried about the one product, carbon dioxide, in this particular question. So how do I determine what the limiting reactant is? A common mistake I see is students assuming whichever one you have less of can be assumed to be the limiting reactant. In this case, we have less citric acid than sodium bicarbonate. But you can't assume that because if a recipe requires twice as much flour as sugar, then you may run out of flour before sugar, even if you have more flour. Same idea with chemical reactions. We require three times as much sodium bicarbonate as we do citric acid, so we may actually run out of sodium bicarbonate first, even though we have more of it. So how do we go about doing this? Well, first of all, in any stoichiometry problem, when we're comparing two things in a chemical reaction, and we see they have a ratio, in this case it is a 3 to 1 to 3 ratio, comparing the two reactants and the product that we're interested in, these are molar ratios, so we have to first be in moles before we can make any sort of comparison. We're starting off in grams. So step number one of this, of this problem is to convert those grams to moles. So to convert from grams to moles, we do this by dividing by the molar mass. So to get the molar masses of each, we add up the atomic masses of each element. So go ahead and do that for sodium bicarbonate. That is 84.01 grams per mole. For the citric acid, that's 192.12 grams per mole. And then for carbon dioxide, it's 44.01 grams per mole. So let's go ahead and for our two reactants, convert them both to moles. So starting with the sodium bicarbonate, we have 1.7 grams. When we divide by the molar mass, grams will cancel and we'll be left with moles. And then do the same thing with the citric acid. Now at this point in the solution, my method differs a little bit from what you'll see in your textbook if you're following along. I'll be using the method shown in the two-page spread on fi in figure 3.7. I prefer this method because rather than determining how much of each reactant is needed based on how much of the other reactant, if you go ahead and determine which one is the limiting reactant according to which one makes less product, then you've killed two birds with one stone because at the end of that you not only know which one's the limiting reactant, but you've also answered the question of how much product was formed. So I'm going to use that method. So starting with my moles of each reactant, the way this method works is I'm going to go ahead and determine how much product each one made. Now the products, I've got three different products here, but the question was specifically asking me for the uh, mass of carbon dioxide. So I'm going to focus on the product carbon dioxide and not worry about the other two products. Whichever one of these reactants, sodium bicarbonate or citric acid, makes less carbon dioxide, that one is our limiting reactant. And then we also will know how much carbon dioxide has formed and we will have answered question C at the same time. 
So to, do, to go ahead and calculate this, we're going to take our moles of each reactant, multiply by the molar ratio to get to moles of carbon dioxide. So for the sodium bicarbonate, so molar ratio is what we're looking for on top. We're looking for carbon dioxide, so carbon dioxide goes on top. And the number in front is a 3. And on the bottom, we put what we currently have, drops down to the bottom. We currently have sodium bicarbonate, so that's going to go on the bottom. Three there. And we have a 3 in front of sodium bicarbonate, so a 3 goes on the bottom. That way, when we multiply by the molar ratio, the sodium bicarbonate will cancel. And 3 over 3, so the number doesn't change, and we would be producing 0.20. 24 moles of CO2 if sodium bicarbonate is our limiting reactant. Now let's do the exact same thing for the citric acid. Multiply by the molar ratio to figure out how much carbon dioxide that can produce. So three carbon dioxides on top, and we've only got one, understood one, citric acid on the bottom. So when we multiply this across, citric acid will cancel times three. So we get 0 0.01562 moles of carbon dioxide. So between the two of these, we made less product, less carbon dioxide, when we used the citric acid as the limiting reactant. So that must be our limiting reactant. So citric acid is our limiting reactant. Now not only do we know what our limiting reactant are, so we've answered that question, but we also know how much carbon dioxide forms, but the question is how, what mass. So we still have one more step because we don't have mass, we have moles. So just like to go from grams to moles, divide by molar mass. To go from moles back to grams, we do the opposite, so we multiply by molar mass. And the molar mass of carbon dioxide, don't forget, is 44.01. So we're going to take those moles of carbon dioxide and convert them to grams. And now we have our final answer for part C the mass of carbon dioxide produced. So in the original question, we've answered which ingredient is the limiting reactant. It was the citric acid. We've determined what mass of carbon dioxide forms. So the last part here, part B asks what mass of the excess reactant is left over when the reaction is complete. So if citric acid is our excess reactant, then the sodium bicarbonate, or sorry, citric acid is our limiting reactant, then the sodium bicarbonate must be our excess reactant. So we need to determine how much of this was actually used and subtract that from how much we actually started with to determine what mass was left. And I'm just going to leave it in moles for now just because that's fewer uh, conversions to do. So to determine how much citric or how much sodium bicarbonate was actually used, we're going to take the moles of carbon dioxide that was formed and work backwards to figure out well how much carbon dioxide would be necessary to produce those moles of CO2. And all we're going to do is take our molar ratio from here and flip it. So now instead of CO2 being on top, CO2 is what we're starting with, so it drops to the bottom. Factor label method back from chapter one, very beginning. Whatever unit you start with goes diagonal, so if it starts on top, it drops to the bottom. So same deal here as we've been doing since chapter one. The unit we want goes on top. We want sodium bicarbonate, so sodium bicarbonate goes on top. And the ratio from the balanced equation is 3 to 3. 3, carbon dioxide will cancel, and we'll let, be left with how many moles of sodium bicarbonate are required. Now, we know how many moles we started with. We started with 0.2024 moles of sodium bicarbonate, and now we're saying that this 0.01562 moles of sodium bicarbonate is how much is necessary, how much was consumed. So to figure out well, how much is left over, it's a simple subtraction. So 0 0.02024 0 moles of sodium bicarbonate we started with. subtract, and this is how much is remaining. But this is in moles, and we want 
the mass. So again, to go from moles back to grams, we multiply by that molar mass. The molar mass for sodium bicarbonate again was 84.01. So, and so we are left with 0 0.0388 grams of the sodium bicarbonate remaining. So we've answered all three questions. Which one is the limiting reactant? It was the citric acid. What mass of the excess reactant is left over when the reaction is complete? We just answered that. And what mass of CO2 forms? So we have the mass of CO2 that forms and the mass of our excess reactant that remains. And those are the three types of questions that you will see with limiting reactant problems.